Hello everyone, and welcome to my first model showcase video. So, this first video is going to be on Zorin. Uh, he's the one who won out in the comments of my last video, my return video. Because I asked everyone, you know, out of all the models I showed in that video, what did people want to see the most? And Zorin is the one who got the most votes. Uh, Big Mac was very close. He got, like, maybe one or two less. Um, but Zorin definitely got the most votes, so, you know, he's the one that's getting the first video. So first I want to go into the basic methods that went into making him. Uh, so he's made out of mainly cardboard and masking tape. Like, here are some pictures of while he was still being worked on. He basically, uh, I made the basic structure out of cardboard and masking tape, and then I smoothed over the masking tape with, uh, with wetted down clay. Uh, so I basically had this uh, Crayola air dry clay, and I, I wetted it to make sure that it would uh, you know, go on smoothly and be very malleable. Um, and then I kind of smeared it over all the places where there were imperfections or where there were seams. But the air dry clay will crack as it shrinks. And so the hole isn't getting any smaller, but the clay is, so naturally it cracks. Uh, and the way I got around that was before the clay was totally dry, I put a layer of Mod Podge uh, around the whole uh, hole. You know, it would basically seal in the clay. Uh, and there is one downside to this, which is that the Mod Podge doesn't really stick to the clay. Uh, the clay is very dusty and dry, and uh, the Mod Podge is basically like a skin all around it. So, you know, the model is fine if you're handling it normally, but if you were to, say, put a piece of tape on the side of the hole and pull it off, it would just tear the, the skin of the model right off, essentially. But I think that's worth it to make it smoother, because it really elevates the look. So then I went ahead and I painted this model with uh, acrylic paints. Um, really, I tried to use thick paints, because and, and, and a lot of parts of this model I actually just finger painted. Like the hole, there's so much black paint to put on there and you have to lay it on so thick in order to get that look and to kind of also try to use the paint to cover up some of the imperfections and smooth over them. Same way I use the Mod Podge. I, I had to use so much paint that I just got tired of using a brush because the thing is a brush, I mean, depending on the one you use, it'll leave brush strokes and I really didn't want that. So I just got in the habit of just smearing it with my fingers and, and that worked just fine. For the superstructure, I mixed this kind of reddish-brown color. It's a little bit darker, I think, than the model from the show, but you know, I still quite like it. I mean, I do like the look of this. Um, and then I watered down some brown and black paint and kind of mixed them together. Uh, and I dabbed that all over the areas where all these panels on the side meet. Uh, and the reason I did that was just to kind of give it a weathered look, because that seems to be where all the weathering kind of accumulates on the actual model. Like I said, the whole thing's made of cardboard. Uh, the superstructure was made out of cardboard, and then I took thinner cardboard, cut it out as little, like, panels. I glued them all in sequence across the side of the model uh, to create this kind of paneling effect that you see here. All the port holes and the door handles and stuff, those are all paper clips. They're just bent into certain positions. Um, the, uh, the whistle and the, uh, this thing behind the funnel, I'm not sure what it is, maybe like a safety valve or something. You know, these are both paper clips but just with tape wrapped around them so it's a little bit thicker because I would have used some model trees which are basically these little um you know they're, they're these these like plastic things that you pull parts of when you get like a model kit uh, I used to use these for the axles on my wooden railway engines that I would make uh, but you know now I really just use them when I need kind of a thin cylindrical object I basically take one of these I cut off all the little pegs on it and I sand it down and then I have a thin cylinder uh, so I used, I used that method for a few parts of this model, like these little uh, pipes back here. However, they were too thick for the whistle and the safety valve or whatever this thing back here is. So I instead took a paper clip uh, and I straightened it out and then I put uh, tape all around it so that it would be thicker. I modeled the whistle out of clay, I think, and then painted it black and glued it into position. For the smaller details, like the hat and these uh, ventilation pipes and everything, I used cardboard and masking tape for these as well. Um, and then I, you know, really the same method as the hole. I used a lot of clay and uh, I used Mod Podge. And I, you know, that's how I made the hat so smooth and I made the ventilation pipes smooth. I used a lot of clay and Mod Podge. And there are a few things I've updated since I last showed this model in the return video. Like, I added the wires that hold the funnel and the mast up. And I painted these mooring posts black. Uh, they were just tape colored before. Th this model still isn't finished for a lot of reasons. Like, you know, the big thing is that I just, 
I kind of grew tired of this scale. And the reason for that, there's a few reasons. One, uh, it was really, really difficult to put an eye mechanism in this thing. It's a really finicky eye mechanism. Um, you know, and I'll show how it works in a second. Uh, two is that I wanted to put lights in this model and it actually, I got it working for a little while, but I, I couldn't really figure out how to wire it properly and the right voltage that I should give the lights. So they kept burning out. And, uh, and the worst part is that, uh, if this were Big Mac, right? Cause Big Mac is show scale. Um, well then, you know, it would have been easy because the model, uh, that there's a lot of room in the head. I could have just taken these little, uh, these little finger lights, these little, um, you know, just these tiny little lights, right? And I could have stuck them through the sides and that would be that because there's enough room for that. But Zorin's head is so small, I couldn't do that. Those lights would have been too big for the look. So instead what I did is I put the lights in the middle of the wheelhouse, basically put cardboard all around them so that light couldn't escape uh, and go in a direction I didn't want it to go. And I directed it out these little holes on the sides of the wheelhouse. Um, and then what I did is I took these little translucent plastic pieces. Again, these are little cylindrical pieces I cut off of some model trees. Um, and I stuck those through the sides. So those were pretending to be the lights when really they're just touching the lights in the very inside. It's, it's a lot like how a toy lightsaber works, where it kind of beams light through the whole thing, even though the actual saber itself is uh, really just like a translucent tube. So it's a lot like that, you know, I, and it worked really well. I'm actually quite proud of how it turned out, but it was so difficult to work with, especially with when I have to keep going in there to fix the eyes. It's like the wheelhouse was packed and it really just, it, it was very finicky. It would fall out of place a lot. These little pegs would get lost and they'd fall out of the wheelhouse. And it was just, a, it was a huge pain. Um, so I got frustrated about that. And uh, I got frustrated with the scale in general because it was so hard to work with relative to the actual tug scale. Because this is more like O scale, and Tugs is more like G scale. So, you know, this O scale kind of Zorin has just been a lot more difficult to work with because, uh, you know, he, he's much more limiting in terms of space. And the big reason I walked away from this is because sometimes when you make a model, you notice a fundamental flaw and it's too late to fix it. And for Zorin, that was the splash rails, you know, these white things along here. Um, they're too big. You know, they're, they're, they're too bumpy and they're too big. And I realized this pretty late in that I had made them too big. Um, they should really be more like this, but instead I made them like this. And it really ruins the illusion because I think the top half of the model is pretty convincing. It, it's, it doesn't, you know, it, you can still tell that it's not the one from the show, but it's not unconvincing. But the bottom half is just immediately, you can see it and tell that it's not the one from the show. At least that's my case. And because of that, I got frustrated with it. That and also the stern isn't long enough. It should be a little bit longer. Um, you know, it, it should be more like this, uh, but it's not. And, you know, I, I could just totally rebuild the hull since all the problems are localized to the hull, but that's like half the work of the model is building that. So, you know, I, I really didn't want to. And I just got burnt out with Zorin and I wanted to do something different. And that's why I built Big Mac because he's the same scale as the, the tugs from the show. And I kind of just wanted to get away from the hassle of doing O scale. So I, I went to G scale instead because it was just, you know, O scale had gotten so frustrating. And a big part of that was the eye mechanism. So let me show you how the eye mechanism works. So let me show you what the controller does. The, the controller has six channels, but we're only using three of them, which is the left right here, uh, the up down here, and the, uh, uh, the left right over here for the head. And this controller is a fly sky, uh, CT6B is what it is. Um, and I got this on eBay for like uh, 50 bucks, I think, which, I mean, it, it seems pretty expensive, but keeping in mind that they make these types of controllers for like airplanes, it's probably a pretty cheap model airplane controller. And, and plus, I kind of just wanted it to look like the controllers from Tugs. I mean, it would have been weird if it was like, you know, some other type of controller. Something else would have worked, but I really like this layout. So let me take off the face to demonstrate. By, by the way, the face, um, I sculpted it out of Crayola air dry clay. Uh, and then I, I, I used like a few, um, like I used a thumbtack to kind of get the little details and scrape out clay uh, out of the eyes and like the, around the nose and stuff. Um, and I used like a, uh, you know, a, a knife from my multi-tool to cut off the edges, you know, where it's like you had excess on the sides and you, you need to get this nice sharp edge. 
Um, you know, so I, I basically, you know, I would cut off larger portions of clay with this and then dig out little bits of clay with the thumbtack. I painted the face using this paint. Uh, most of the ones I have that are like this are testers paints, but I think this one is something else. Um, I mixed in a little bit of white paint to get this color. It was a little bit darker before. I realized, uh, you know, about a year ago that the, the color of the tug's faces isn't actually like a pinkish color. It's more of a, a yellowish tan. Once I realized that, I think I could make the faces a lot more accurate. I'm pretty proud of how this one turned out. The thing is, because of the size, you know, because it's a smaller scale, you can definitely see imperfections more easily. The bigger a face is, the, you know, the smaller the imperfections seem proportionally. I used this uh, special type of black pen to do the eyebrows and uh, the mustache. And I used a thumbtack with some white paint to, uh, to paint on the teeth. And then I just taped on the plastic hooks on the back, which are... Um, they're just like a thin plastic that you get it like um, when you like get a wooden railway item or something. Um, you know, you've got the bubble that's like got that plastic. It's really just like that. So, you know, the way that I made Zoran's face, I basically made this mold with a half cylinder on it. And then I molded his face around that. And that half cylinder, it's just a little bit bigger than the uh, his, his eyes are. And this, the half cylinder on the mold is actually uh, at an angle. It's slanted. And the reason for that is that Zoran's eyes are slanted because his eyes, unlike every other character in Tugs, are not vertical. They're actually diagonal because he has this very imposing forehead. And because of that, uh, I had to sculpt, not, not only did I have to sculpt the face diagonally, where like the, the, eye, the, the whole uh, inside of the face is like a diagonal cylinder, but I also had to build the entire eye mechanism diagonally in order to fit the face, which wouldn't, wouldn't have been too complicated on the show model, but on this model, it's very complicated, and let me show you why. So first, let me take off the eyes. They're just like a little slip of paper with the eyes printed on it. So let me take the head off, and as you can see, it's got like a uh, kind of a square peg on the bottom, and that fits into this little thing underneath the deck. So let me take the, uh, let me take the deck off, let me take the superstructure off and show you what's under here. So the superstructure has this little tube underneath it that this shaft fits into so that it can only turn left and right. It doesn't like move anywhere I don't want it to turn. And this shaft is where all the action happens. Uh, it's at the very bottom. We've got a servo planted permanently into the bottom of the hole. Uh, and these servos, uh, they're just little motors that turn like 45 degrees left or right. And these servos come with little uh, connectors that you can snap onto the top of them on the part that rotates. So I planted one of these connectors in the bottom of this shaft, and then I put two other servos inside of this shaft. Uh, and the black stick that you saw earlier that the eyes were connected to, that's where it's coming from. So there are two servos in here. There's, a, there's an up and down servo uh, that's you know, doing the up and down eye movements, and then that's moving the left and right servo up and down. So, you know, these two motions together uh, move the eyes. So the up and down servo is permanently fixed to the shaft, whereas the left and right servo is in this very specific shaft of its own, where it moves up and down, but it doesn't wiggle in a way I don't want it to. It's literally just able to go up and down. And when I say up and down, what I really mean is diagonal, because the whole shaft that the left and right servo moves in is actually mounted at an angle so that the black peg is at an angle so that the eyes are at an angle so that they match the face, which is very annoying because then I have to translate this whole motion all the way up to the top. This would be a lot simpler on another character like Warrior or something. And the reason this is so complicated and I built this whole big shaft is because I needed the eyes and the head to move in unison. You can see that the, the head uh, has this square peg that fits right into the top of this shaft, right? which means that when the servo at the very bottom of the shaft turns left and right, it turns the head as well as the eye mechanism that's on board the shaft. So, you know, because of that, it moves it all together. Now, on the show, there's just a servo underneath the head, and the eye mechanism is in the head. So, you know, there's no problem. It just turns the whole head, and the eye mechanism is inside of it. So, you know, that works fine. But because this model is so small, I had to create basically... The same thing that the head does, where it carries those two servos uh, in tugs, I had to recreate that under the deck, so that the left and right servo that turns the head also turns these eye servos. So it was very complicated, 
but you know it, it, it looks all right you know it looks good so you know I, I'm happy with the uh, the results of it and how it works I just I am just infuriated by uh, how you know finicky it is and, and how it can break easily and so how does this work electronically uh, well these three servos all have wires that feed into this receiver so the receiver comes with the controller and technically it's called a transmitter um, but you know, I'm just calling it a controller because that's what everyone's familiar with. Um, so the receiver receives the signals from the transmitter and it sends those signals to the servos. The receiver has six slots for uh, all six channels and it's got one slot for the battery. So originally I just plugged the battery pack straight into there. Um, this is like a Futaba uh, four pack, you know, double A battery pack. That's what this is. It's, it was only like two or three bucks. And I, I, I used to just plug it straight in until I realized that I had to unplug it if I didn't want it to drain the battery. Because the thing I didn't realize is that, um, and I should have thought of this, is that the receiver needs a low level current at all times so that it's ready to uh, receive a signal from the transmitter. It's the same reason why your TV is always sort of on because you know it needs to be able to respond to the remote. And when I realized that, well, I just unplugged the thing every time I was done with it, but that got really annoying, and, and also it's going to wear out the, the plug sooner. So instead, I decided to invest in some uh, switches. So I got a switch here that you know basically turns the thing on and off and cuts power to the battery. And so every time I'm ready to use this, um, I just open up the, uh, th this compartment back here, and I reach in there and I turn the thing on, uh, and then I you know, put the cover back on. And I've gotten better at reassembling this thing over time, like just because I've done it so many times. Um, but it's still kind of a hassle. Like you got to make sure that little black peg doesn't come out of place, that it it's kind of snaps in properly, or else it won't work. Um, and that it's in there secure, because if it shakes loose, then you got to take the whole thing apart again. You got to put the superstructure uh, over the uh, shaft to make sure that it lines up properly and it, it's you know going to work. Then you have to plug the wheelhouse into the square bit uh, at the top of the shaft. And the, the most difficult part is you have to then put the eyes onto that black peg without tearing the peg out of its slot. And then once you put the face on, it's smooth sailing, and, and the whole thing stays together pretty well. So that's the eye mechanism. Um, but there are a few other things that I haven't pointed out yet that I'd like to talk about before we close here. I went into GIMP, my editing software for photos, and I basically traced over in black and white a picture of the uh, actual Zorin nameplate on the model um, because I wanted it to be crisper. Um, so I did that and then I printed it out and put it on this model. I didn't even glue it on, it's just kind of sitting on there. And I originally intended to put like kind of another layer of Mod Podge over everything, but I never got to it because, like I said, I just kind of got annoyed with the model. These bow ropes at the front, uh, they're not particularly accurate to how Zorins are supposed to be in the pattern and everything. They're basically just a crocheting pattern that I learned that were kind of general for, for bow ropes. But it looks close enough, and I'm, I'm fairly happy with how it turned out. Um, it used I made it out of yarn. It used to be like a brighter color, but I dipped it in this kind of watered-down brownish paint. Like, I really watered it down and then dipped it in there. Um, and then it created this, this kind of color. Um, it was like a yellowish-brownish paint that I, I kind of wanted to make it look more uh, like the color in the show. I made the propeller out of the same plastic that I used for the uh, hooks on the back of the face. Um, and I basically bent it into shape. It's a pretty neat pattern. Um, and I made the rudder so it could actually turn. Uh, it's got these paper clips that are sticking out of uh, either end of it that are sticking into the model so that it can turn. And there are a few things I'll never get to putting on here, like, you know, like the little bumpers on the sides that are supposed to be there, the name on the back, the flags, the number, there was a, a light at the mast at some point, um, which is still there, but it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> and I took the lights out of the head a long time ago. Um, and I never even got to putting the light, uh, the searchlight right here where it was supposed to go. So that's it for me. That's the, uh, that's Zorin's showcase video. So if you got any questions in the comments, I'm happy to answer anything that you got. So thank you very much for watching and I hope you enjoyed.